Ah, welcome to my library. If there are any books you are looking for, please do not hesitate to ask. Now let us begin. Morning Star, Book One, The Last Year of the First Era, by Karlovac Townway. Almalexia lay in her bed of fur, dreaming. Not until the sun burned through the window, infusing the light wood and flesh colors of her chamber in a milky glow, did she open her eyes. It was quiet and serene, a stunning reverse of the flavor of her dreams, so full of blood and celebration. For a few months, she simply stared at the ceiling, trying to sort through her visions. In the courtyard of her palace was a boiling pool which steamed in the coolness of the winter morning. At a wave of her hand, it cleared, and she saw the face of a form of her lover, Vivek, in his study to the north. She did not want to speak right away. He looked so handsome, in his dark red robes, writing his poetry as he did every morning. Vivek, she said, and he raised his head in a smile, looking at her face across thousands of miles. I have seen a vision of the end of the war. After eighty years, I don't think anyone can imagine an end, said Vivek with a smile. But he grew serious, trusting Amalexia's prophecies. Who will win, Morrowind or the Cyrodiilic Empire? Without Sothasil in Morrowind, we will lose, she replied. My intelligence tells me the Empire will strike us to the north in early springtide, by first sea at the latest. Could you go to Arteum and convince him to return? I'll leave today, she said simply. Chapter 2 Fourth of Morningstar, Gideon, Blackmarsh The Empress paced around her cell. Wintertide gave her wasteful energy, while in the summer she would merely sit by her window and be grateful for each breath of stale swamp wind that came to cool her. Across the room, her unfinished tapestry of a dance at the Imperial Court seemed to mock her. She ripped it from its frame, tearing the pieces apart as they drifted to the floor. Then. She laughed at her own useless gesture of defiance. She would have plenty of time to repair it and craft a hundred more. The Emperor had locked her up in Castle Giaves seven years ago and would likely keep her there until she died. With a sigh, she pulled the cord to call her knight, Zook, who appeared at the door within minutes, fully uniformed and befitted an imperial guard. Most of the native Kothringi tribesmen of Blackmarsh preferred to go about naked, but Zook had taken a positive delight to fashion. His silver reflective skin was scarcely visible, only his face, neck, and hands. Your Imperial Highness, he said with a bow. Zook, said Empress Tavia, I'm bored. Let's discuss methods of assassinating my husband today. Chapter 3 14th of Morningstar The Imperial City Cyrodiil The chimes proclaiming Southwind's prayer echoed through the wide boulevards and gardens of the Imperial City, calling all of their temples. The Emperor Raman III always attended a service at the Temple of the One, while his son, and heir Prince Juliac found it more political to attend a service at a different temple for each religious holiday. This year, it was at the Cathedral Benevolence of Mara. The Benevolence's services were mercifully short, but it was not until the afternoon that the Emperor was able to return to the palace. By then, the arena combatants were impatiently waiting for the start of the ceremony. The crowd was far less restless, as the potentate Versidouche 
had arranged a demonstration for a troop of Kajiti acrobats. Your religion is so much more convenient than mine, said the emperor to his potentate, by way of an apology. What is the first game? A one-on-one -on -one battle between two able warriors, said the potentate, his scaly skin catching the sun as he rose, armed, befitting their culture. Sounds good, said the emperor and clapped his hands. Let the sport commence. As soon as he saw the two warriors enter the arena, to the roar of the crowd, Emperor Raman III remembered that he had agreed to this several months before and forgotten about it. One combatant was the potentate's son, Severian Jorak, a glistening ivory-yellow eel gripping his katana, and Wakizashi with his thin, deceptively weak-looking arms. The other was the emperor's son, Prince Juilek, in ebony armor, with a savage orcish helm, shield and longsword at his side. This will be fascinating to watch, hissed the potentate, a wide grin on his narrow face. I don't know if I've ever seen a Cyrodiil fight an Akavir like this. Usually it's army against army. At least we can settle which philosophy is better. To create armor to combat swords as your people do, or to create swords to combat armor as mine do. No one in the crowd, aside from a few scattered Akaviri counselors and the potentate himself, wanted Severian Chorak to win. But there was a collective intake of breath at the sight of his graceful movements. His sword seemed to be a part of him, a tail coming from his arms to match the one behind him. It was a trick of counterbalance, allowing the young serpent man to roll up into a circle and spin into the center of the ring in offensive position. The prince had to plod forward the less impressive traditional way. As they sprang at each other, the crowd bellowed with delight. The Akaviri was like a moon in orbit around the prince, effortlessly spinning over his shoulder to attempt a blow from behind. But the prince rolled around quickly to block him with his shield. His counter-strike met only air as his foe fell flat to the ground and slithered between his legs, tripping him. The prince fell to the ground with a resounding crash. Metal and air melted together as Severian Chorak rained strike after strike upon the prince, who blocked every one with his shield. We don't have shields in our culture, murmured Versidu Shea to the emperor. It seems strange to my boy, I imagine. In our country, if you don't want to get hit, you move out the way. When Severian Chorak was rearing back to begin another series of blinding attacks, the prince kicked at his tail, sending him falling back momentarily. In an instant, he had rebounded, but the prince was also back on his feet. The two circled one another until the snake man spun forward, katana extended. The prince saw his foe's plan and blocked the katana with his longsword and the wakazashi with his shield. Its short punching blade impaled itself into the metal, and Savarian Chorak was thrown off balance. The prince's long blade slashed across the Akaviri's chest, and the sudden intense pain caused him to drop both his weapons. In a moment, it was over. Savarian Chorak was prostrate in the dust, and the prince's longsword at his throat. The game's over, shouted the emperor, barely heard over the applause of the stadium. The prince grinned and helped Savarian Chorak up and over to a healer. The emperor clapped his potentate on the back, feeling relieved. He had not realized when the fight had begun how little chance he had given his son at victory. He will make a fine warrior, said Versidu Shea and a great emperor. Just remember, laughed the emperor, you Akaviri have a lot of showy moves, but if just one of our strikes come through, it's all over for you. Oh, I'll remember that, nodded the potentate. Raman thought about the comment for the rest of the games, and he had trouble 
fully enjoying himself. Could the potentate be another enemy, just as the empress had turned out to be? The matter would bear watching. Chapter 4 21st of Morningstar, Mournhold, Morrowind Why don't you wear that green gown I gave you? asked the Duke of Mournhold, watching the young maiden put on her clothes. It doesn't fit, smiled Turala, and you know I like red. It doesn't fit because you're getting fat, laughed the Duke, pulling her down on the bed and kissing the pouch on her stomach. She laughed at the tickles, but pulled herself up, wrapping her red robe around her. I'm round like a woman should be, said Turala. Will I see you tomorrow? No, said the Duke. I must entertain Vivek tomorrow. And the next day the Duke of Ebonheart is coming. Do you know, I never really appreciated Amalexia and her political skills until she left. It is the same with me smiled Turala. You will only appreciate me when I'm gone. That's not true at all, snorted the Duke. I appreciate you now. Turala allowed the Duke one last kiss before she was out the door. She kept thinking about what he said. Would he appreciate her more or less when he knew that she was getting fat because she was carrying his child? Would he appreciate her enough to marry her? The year continues in Sun's Dawn, Book Two. A most fascinating read, if I do say so myself. Ah, fighting for sport. What a waste. And there was too much romance. I guess you cannot please everyone. <laughs>